Well, thank you, Robert, for that very generous introduction, I think, on the subject of ornament, so I'll quit while I'm behind. Um, colleagues, friends, ladies and gentlemen, it is really almost impossible to overstate the significance of the coup, the counter-coup, and the savage violence which followed it in Indonesia 50 years ago. Certainly one of the three great turning points in Indonesian history, along with the Declaration of Independence, of course, and then President Suharto's later resignation in May 98. First of all, in terms of domestic, uh, political, and economic management, the counter-coup uh, launched by Suharto did, of course, mark the beginning of the end of the Sukarno regime and the birth of the new order, about as seismic a shift to the right as is possible to imagine. It was crucial not only to the establishment of a business and market-friendly economic environment, but also to the delegitimization of Sukarno and his political legacy, uh, which was seen by Suharto, of course, as a crucial precondition for the establishment of his own credibility and later legacy. Throughout Suharto's 31-year uh, rule, the story of the coup was in fact the sustaining foundation um, of that order, or at least the New Order's version of the coup, complete with semi-naked women dancing around their communist comrades as the seven army officers were tortured and executed and stuffed down that well near the Halim Air Force Base. The execution site, as we all know, became hallowed ground with the erection of the Monument Hachisila Sakti with its lurid bronze reliefs, and the government-sponsored uh, four-hour-long film about the kidnapping and killing of the army officers, the, the treason of the September 30th movement, PKI, as it was called, was required national viewing every 30 September. So the internal aspects of this were obviously crucial. In terms of the regional geopolitics and the significance of that, Suharto's elevation following the coup obviously had extremely significant strategic consequences for the region during the height of the Cold War. With Suharto's accession to power, Indonesia did shift almost overnight from being a strong voice for neutrality and anti-imperialism, actively courting the attention of the Soviet Union and Communist China, to becoming a very much more compliant partner with the United States and its campaign against communist encroachment into Southeast Asia. This, in turn, resulted in a much more comfortable relationship with US allies, not least Australia, than would have been imaginable had Sukarno and his legacy been maintained. Both Liberal and Labor governments in Australia saw Suharto, continued to see Suharto as a stabilizing force in the region. And despite the running sore for so long of East Timor and various other impediments that rose from time to time, our relationship on security issues was, at its best, very close, very productive. As manifested, for example, I guess, in terms of my own work with Ali Alatas on the Cambodia issue, and Paul Keating's uh, very dramatic negotiation with Suharto of that far-reaching bilateral security treaty. Third area of significance is in terms of global geopolitics. In this context, I think it's right to say that the coup and its aftermath had less impact at the time and for years afterwards than it should have had. But that doesn't diminish its significance for us now as a case study, really, in the politics of mass murder. What you can get away with when you characterise and demonise opponents in a particular way, achieving ends which are conceivably defensible, but by means which are morally atrocious. We don't know to this day just how many scores or hundreds of thousands of members or sympathisers or alleged supporters of the PKI, painted as it was as an atheist force of evil, which had to be annihilated. We don't know how many were murdered in cold blood and hot blood in the massacre that spread across the country from October 65. But the most common estimates uh, are, of course, as Robert has said, more than 500,000. Described at the time by the CIA itself as one of the worst mass murders of the 20th century, although it has to be said, 
that description not being offered in any obvious spirit of distaste by the CIA at the time, the Indonesian killings do remain the only ones at anything like this scale that have not really been the subject of minute international attention or any kind of significant truth-finding, let alone reconciliation process. Yes, there has been some increasing attention to it all in recent years, but overall, this is the least studied and least talked about political genocide of the last century, and completely lifting the veil on it now really is, I think, long overdue. The stimulus for doing so may well prove to be the release three years ago of Joshua Oppenheimer's really quite extraordinary documentary film, The Act of Killing, which no doubt most of you have seen, which you'll know is a meticulous and which in meticulous and really horrifying detail records a group of former death squad leaders reenacting the murders that they themselves committed. Not, at least initially, in any spirit of confession or remorse, but rather to portray themselves as heroes and victors of a necessary national purging operation. Some commentators, including one or two in this room, one not very far from where I'm standing at the moment, um, have been unpersuaded of the accuracy of some of the depictions in the film. Others have been troubled by the bizarre and occasionally surreal uh, character of the film within a film structure adopted by the director. But I have to say that from my own point of view, the act of killing is the most haunting, the most scarifying documentary that I've ever seen. And I hope very much that, as is beginning to happen, it finds the audience and the impact that it needs, not only at the world's film festivals, but in Indonesia itself. Now, it's the purpose of this conference, as I understand it, to focus on the coup and the counter-coup rather than the massacre which followed it. And while that's perfectly understandable, given the uncertainty and the controversy which still exist about what lay behind the key coup events, I do hope that efforts continue to be made, both in Indonesia and internationally, <coughs> to fully document the scale of that violence, 65, 66, and to draw appropriate lessons from it. The immediate events of that fateful night of September 30, October 1, 50 years ago, uh, do seem, on the face of it, straightforward enough. As you'll know and will no doubt be recounted again in the papers which follow, in the early hours of the morning, soldiers led by the commander of the President's Palace Guard, Lieutenant General Untong um, Simsuri, kidnapped six high-ranking generals, including the Army Commander, Lieutenant General Ahmed Yani, from their homes in Jakarta and executed them, dumping the bodies in that well near Halim, known as the Crocodile Hole, with a, another lieutenant mistakenly captured at the home of the seventh general also being murdered. Soldiers associated with the coup seized national radio station identified themselves as troops loyal to President Sukarno, acting to protect him from a clique of right-wing generals, calling themselves the September 30th movement. Hundreds of the movement soldiers occupied Jakarta's central square, or at least three sides of the square, leaving unguarded, interestingly, the eastern side, where the headquarters of Kostrad, the Armed Forces Strategic Reserve, commanded by Major General Sahato, happened to be located. In the absence of Yani, Major General Sahato took command of the army, as you all know, during 1 October, launched a counter-coup that evening. The September 30 movement evaporated as quickly as it appeared. All rebel troops fled, they were captured or killed by the morning of the 2nd of October, and the movement didn't last beyond the 3rd of October in central Java. Sahato and his associates immediately blamed PKI as the masterminds of the movement, spread horrific stories about the torture and mutilation of the executed officers, and initiated the army-led murder massacre, which rapidly followed. What is much less straightforward to explain, and still much contested, is who was ultimately responsible for all of this. The five captured coup leaders revealed very little with their show trials, I think that's reasonable to call them that, more about desperate refutations of charges that they were meeting than explaining in any detail how and why the movement existed. 
All but one of those coup leaders were convicted of treason and shot, and the remaining leader, Colonel Abdul Latif, declined throughout and after long years of imprisonment to explain the movement in detail, although his trial testimony did contain that potentially quite explosive revelation that he'd given Sahato prior warning of the coup. So the various theories that have been advanced, and which will no doubt be exhaustively re-examined uh, during this conference, include that <coughs> first the coup was indeed plotted by the Indonesian Communist Party, PKI, <coughs> using junior military dupes to carry out the dirty work. Two, that the junior military officers acted on their own to prevent a planned seizure of power by a council of generals. Three, that the <coughs> coup was the result of dissatisfaction by junior officers with lack of promotions and with the corruption and perceived decadence of venality of their superiors, with the, key, with the PKI being <coughs> just sort of brought in to divert attention from the embarrassing reality of the army's involvement. Four, the President Sakana himself plotted the coup using the commander of his own palace guard as the dupe in question. Then five, that Sahata plotted the coup. Sahata himself plotted the coup, which enabled him to <coughs> get rid of his superiors in the army and subsequently the PKI and Sakana. Next, that Sahata did that, uh, all this with the instigation with the support of the United States. And then finally, I think my favourite one, that the whole thing was planned by the British Foreign Office and MI6, uh, aimed at liquidating Sukarno because of fears of the spread of confrontation policy. Well, as wildly implausible as some of these accounts may be, the reality is that there is simply no definitive, unchallenged analysis of what actually happened. And given the huge significance of these events, for the future of Indonesia, and indeed the wider world, certainly the wider region, it is entirely appropriate that on this 50th anniversary there should be a refocusing on the coup, the counter coup, and their political context. And as always with Asia Pacific matters, the ANU is the best possible institutional host for this discussion, and delighted to welcome those of you from outside to the ANU for this event. <clears throat> Even if the outstanding lineup of speakers assembled here by Robert and his colleagues don't succeed in definitively resolving the unanswered questions, the effort today will certainly be eminently worthwhile. So in declaring this conference open, I want to wish you the most productive possible deliberations and look forward enormously, as will many other scholars and policymakers in Indonesia and around the world, to reading your proceedings. Thank you.